Hi everybody, welcome to Center Stage. I'm Rajiv, and today I have Laura Drabik, Group VP of Business Innovation from Guidewire Software. Welcome to the show. Welcome, or hello, thank you for having me. So VP of Business Innovation is, is not a normal title you see in the Valley. So tell us a little bit about your, your roles and responsibilities. Yeah, so as the Group VP of Business Innovation at Guywire, I have three main buckets. Uh, the first one is I'm the voice of the customer and okay. also of the industry. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time working with our customers, understanding how they want to innovate, what are their strategic aspirations, mm -hmm. and then also understanding how our industry is evolving. So that's the first bucket. Okay. The second bucket is about being a Guidewire spokesperson mm -hmm. to highlight our thought leadership and help to drive and educate the industry. Okay. So I do interviews like yep. this. <laughs> I advise, mm -hmm. and I also write blogs and do a lot of conference presentations. Fantastic. And then the third bucket is one that's really fun, and that is I drive innovation through hackathons. Okay. So internal and external, it's a great way to get fresh new ideas into mm -hmm. our product and also educate a new generation on insurance and on our company. I actually read recently that you did, you, you sponsored a hackathon um, with some, a lot of students and one female hackathon participant was there. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that yeah. was for DV Hacks. Uh -huh. It was a female led okay. um, high school or student hackathon. So anyone, as long as you were a student, was able to participate. Okay. Um, but out of 200 participants, I think that there were three women. Three women. But okay. again, one was driving it. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. That's, that's great. It's great work. I mean, we need more female engineers out there for we sure. Do. Um, so tell us about how does your company define innovation and embed its understanding into the narrative? Yeah, so how we define innovation is really similar to um, how Adobe did it and okay. their chief product officer, former chief product officer. Mm -hmm. And what he said is innovation isn't about the ideas, it's about making the ideas happen. And to me, that is how we define innovation because mm -hmm. our enterprise software makes our customers' innovation ideas happen. Got it. So we can have carriers where they want to completely change their landscape mm -hmm. and create an Amazon experience for their customers. Mm -hmm. And then we also have other carriers where they just want to improve efficiencies in the claims process. But regardless, it's all about making those ideas happen. And that is what our solution does. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And you started with 16 customers. Now you have over 300. That's correct. Um, and tell us about sort of your experience working with over 300 insurers and, and how you've successfully been able to help them innovate. So I think that um, the biggest factor to innovation and making those ideas happen, mm -hmm. so being successful, mm -hmm. is about uh, creating the proper culture. Okay. So um, we see a lot of carriers um, where they will um, create this more innovative culture, mm -hmm. where they learn a lot from the valley in order to take those learnings and apply them to their own. Okay. So there's three things I think that um, if one is interested in innovating su successfully, which mm -hmm. everyone wants to do, that yes. I would share, which is the first one is about um, creating um, clarity. Okay. Around what it is you're trying to do. Okay. So what is the change? What is the innovation? Mm -hmm. And then communicating it clearly and often. So that's okay. the first thing. Okay. And the second thing successful oh. um, innovators do that I witness is that they also create one team. Mm -hmm. One that? team that's full of diverse talent, though. Okay. So, but if they're not all separate teams. They're all accomplishing that one mandate. Sure. So it's business it's tech technology, it's uh, people also, team members from outside the uh, industry in order to get those fresh ideas. Got it. And then the third thing um, is really about challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. So not thinking that you're rebuilding that legacy environment or main t mentality, mm -hmm. build the new factory. Don't Got rebuild it. the old one. And they do a lot of things that they learn from witnessing and observing and touring local Silicon Valley uh, companies, mm -hmm. like um, create an office space that looks like very entrepreneurial and very Silicon Valley. And we even see customers go so far as in order to really push that innovation successfully, is create an, an entirely new brand. Hmm which is a different mindset, product, and way of doing things that separates them from the legacy world. So clarity, one team, and challenges about status quo. Yes. Love it, yeah. love it. Um, let's talk about insurance companies, and let's talk about sort of the legacy of insurance companies. 
and their ability to innovate. Uh, what's your What's your point of view on that? I think that uh, uh, a carrier will be incredibly successful if they remain open to new ideas. So if you close your mind mm -hmm. towards new ideas and you're just trying to satisfy and, and recreate the old world, mm -hmm. you're never gonna achieve the innovation vision. It's about being open-minded, mm -hmm. It's about bringing in new ideas. Yes. And for us, from the perspective of technology, mm -hmm. our system becomes that new world for them. Got it. So we are the new factory that mm -hmm. they're building, and it's about opening their minds and allowing that change to happen. And do you find that these legacy companies, insurers, are, are receptive to sort of this new way of thinking? I think that they're scared a little bit intimidated as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they know how to think like that because insurance is very regulated. Yes. So they're used to thinking within the regulations of a state or the boundaries of a box, if you will. So this is very unnatural for them. Right. So it's actually trying to shift their mindset in a different direction and push them for new ways of thinking and behaving. Sort of educate them to think differently. Yeah. And be okay with um, sort of the unknown. Yes, exactly. And the possibilities that, that can come from that. Exactly. Um, so what, what mindsets and qualities or talents have you find have you found to characterize top innovators that you most admire? Um, and, and how does one sort of cultivate those attributes? Yeah, good question. So um, I think if you hire people or retain people mm -hmm. that have an open mind or mindset, right. um, what you're allowing them to do is embrace the challenge mm -hmm. and then also um, embrace the change. So having an open mind is incredibly, incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, also, number two is you want to choose people that think differently. So we see a number of our customers that will actually hire outside of the industry because they want those fresh, fresh new ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the third thing I was going to say that I think is incredibly important is being able to retain or hire people that are okay not living in a world that's perfection, perfect or that has perfection or the end result. They're okay and they can do well in a state of flux. Or even ambiguity. In ambiguity, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree 100%. And I, I think we, we live in an area where um, there's a lot of sort of open-mindedness that's accepting new, new ways of thinking and thinking differently, which spawns innovation. Yeah. And we, you see it every day here in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, can you tell me about the work you do with InsureTechs, companies like Livegenic, Frizz, uh, BetterView? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll start off by saying I've been in insurance for or serving the insurance industry for 26 years. And for the last three years, it's gotten very exciting. And okay. it's because of the insure tax. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of my time working with them in order to understand their value propositions. Mm -hmm. I then network and uh, meet with our product people as well as our alliances team in order to see, is there a good fit between these insure techs, their value proposition and our ecosystem? Okay. And then once they make it through a really strict vetting process, mm -hmm. I evangelize for them. Mm -hmm. I will advertise their value props in my executive innovation workshops as well as in my insure tech panels. Got it, got it. 26 years in the insurance industry, ladies and gentlemen. That's a very long time. I just want to sort of double click on that. Tell us how you got started uh, in this, in your career. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I started right out of university. Okay. My goal was not to actually work in insurance. It mm -hmm. was to be a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Um, but based upon the recession at the time, I took the first job that I was offered, which was insurance adjuster, and it's the best thing I ever did. Why is that? Because it allowed me um, to understand and humanize um, the world that I work in now. Okay. So when we go back to the question that you asked me on InsureTech or mm -hmm. about InsureTech, mm -hmm. I know because of my boots on the ground experience working for this carrier, mm -hmm. instantly whether a value prop is going to work. Hmm. And it's that perspective that I add to our technology company and to our corporate world. Hmm. But 
my time as an adjuster allows me to humanize the technology as well as empathize with the consumer that we ultimately serve. Yeah, and we were talking about this before we went on camera. We were yeah. talking about empathy and compassion. Yeah. yeah. And you, you know, you talk about um, commitment to community. Yes. Talk about why, why is that important? I think it's incredibly important um, to be committed to one's community um, because when we join together, Mm -hmm. I mean, we can collectively move and improve and evolve our industry. So InsureTech is a catalyst. Mm -hmm. It's a catalyst yep. that helps to spur change. But it's not until we get together as a community that we'll be able to push this entire industry forward. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so how are InsureTechs evol evolving the insurance industry? So, as I mentioned, they are a catalyst for change. Yes. They are um, creating perhaps discomfort in, in a very old industry, which I welcome mm -hmm. because it um, encourages us all to move forward. Right. Um, what I see, though, is that ultimately what they're doing is the efficiency gains that ca carriers get through an insure tech mm -hmm. is actually helping the end consumer. Okay. It's improving their customer experience, which is good for the industry as a whole and good for the community. Uh, how is it improving? So, it's for changing. example, yeah. I'll give you a couple. So, you mentioned Lifegenic. Yes. So, one of the things that they do is that um, they expedite the intake process for a claim. Okay. So, by using visuals like uh, video mm -hmm. or photos, what they can do is empower the end consumer to get the most detail in on a loss, for example, a car accident, mm -hmm. get it to their insurance company. The insurance company has, has a lot of details and it kickstarts the claim process mm. and then um, shortens it and gets funds into the hands of the insured quicker. Got so it. it really helps to improve in the end, ultimately, right. the customer experience. Right. Um, and I just want to sort of um, ask you a separate question. Are we talking about we're talking about empathy and compassion, which is really important. But you also have talked about chatbots. Oh yeah. And and how that plays a part. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your point of view with chatbots. So chatbots is still one of um, of one of the trends in 2019 with mm -hmm. regards to insure tech. It's a decreasing trend though. Okay. But um, so I wanted to get my plug in for chatbots. Mm -hmm. They're still high. <laughs> but what they allow um, a carrier to do is offer service options. Mm -hmm. So imagine that you are a policyholder that serves in the military. Okay. You might be abroad. Mm -hmm. I mean, the human isn't always available if you're insured through a North American company, available to take your call, answer your questions, um, service your claim. Mm -hmm. but a chatbot never sleeps. Sure. So what it can do is provide an option that delivers 24 by 7 service. And sometimes that's okay, mm -hmm. but sometimes you need the human. human it just sure. extends the service options to the end consumer. Makes a lot of sense. Um, how do you view failure as it relates to innovation? And wh when is it part of the process and when is it unacceptable? Yes. So failure to me is when you don't implement an innovation idea. You don't even attempt it. You have to Be try. You have to try. Okay. But I see people where or carriers or companies where they don't want to um, innovate an idea mm -hmm. because it's too big, it's too complex. Mm -hmm. So when people talk about fail fast, what that means to me is you break down the innovation into iterative cycles. You break it down into these digestible chunks. Makes and then you sense. test learn. Sure. You take the learnings, you apply it to the next iteration. Right. And it's more focused and you right. test and learn again. Yeah. And that to me is a shift from failing mm -hmm. to actually a test and learn which will eventually get you to that innovation goal that you started off which wanting is, or desiring. Makes a lot of sense, which is very similar to sort of the lean startup approach, mm -hmm. which is it can't be perfect. You test it, exactly. you measure it, you improve it, and it keeps getting better and better. Right. You got to start though. You, you got to start. start somewhere. You can't be afraid to start. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, what are your What are your views on thought leadership? So I think that um, I think that real life innovation and change happens within the three to five year time frame. Okay. Why is that? Because the technology that 
one is going to use mm -hmm. is available now or is mature enough now that you can implement within a three to five year time frame. Okay. I think that what's important though is that beyond the five year time frame, mm -hmm. one should always be strategically probing the future. Just sending over a probe, seeing what that mm -hmm. beyond five year looks like okay. and then starting to envelop it as your three to five year time frame uh, moves forward. Okay. But real change, real innovation that I see, it's happening within that time frame. And then where are we in that window right now? Right now, um, there's a lot of change okay. happening, mm -hmm. but the maturity in technology to support it isn't quite there. Okay. So for example, if you take artificial intelligence. AI, hot topic. Hot topic. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful and you hear a lot of different organizations dropping it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the reality of when that will actually be a really um, mature solution, we're looking five to 10 years out. Right. So again, it's okay to start with it, mm -hmm. work with it within the next three to five years to implement real life change and strategically probe what it will look like in the future and constantly test, learn, bring it back into the fold. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, what is the most important thing an innovative leader could or should do regularly to stay effective and fresh in their work? Uh, meet with your customers. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Uh, it's incredibly important because they know how they want to innovate. They just don't know how to get there. They know their industry better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. So if you're innovating for an industry, meet with your customers regularly. Mm -hmm. Number two, read. I allocate an hour every day okay. to reading on not just my industry and how it's evolving, but other industries. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite periodicals that um, I got... Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed when I did my MBA was Harvard Business Review case studies. Sure. Because you learn about what worked. Right. And you learn about what didn't work. And you take those learnings and you bring them back. You so reading. Mm -hmm. And then third, I think, would be um, being connected. Mm -hmm. Staying connected to other thought leaders. I use LinkedIn, so I'm really connected sure. to a number of uh, C-level, insurtechs, customers, all different types of thought leaders. Mm -hmm. And we bounce ideas off of each other using our network. So mm -hmm. staying connected is really important. Um, so you talked about the three to five year window. Where do you where do you see the sort of the trend of where this is going after five years, taking aside AI? The insurance industry in general? Mm -hmm. I see that... Um, I can tell you what consumers want. Okay. And so I've run a number of focus groups with the, our customer's customer, which okay. is the end consumer. Mm -hmm. And they want Netflix. Mm -hmm. They want Google. They want an Amazon experience for this stale, at times dated, industry. And that focus group, what demographic are we, are we talking about? All different demographics. Okay. I'll look at um, baby boomers, uh -huh. and then I'll look at millennials, and then we'll mix them up together. But... It's interesting because millennials are driving a lot of this more innovative digital change, mm -hmm. but the baby boomers and other cohorts are consuming that change. They want it too. Got it. Got it. Interesting. But um, yeah, so with that demographic or across demographics, what they're wanting then is is this more innovative approach to insurance. So our industry and our carriers, our customers are now trying to drive to that. So three to five years out, mm -hmm. getting back to your question, mm -hmm. I think we're gonna see more personalized, less generic, we're gonna see quick, easy, and we're gonna see omni-channel, which is Amazon. All different types of service options, okay. chatbots, people, mm -hmm. um, digital, website, mm -hmm. smartphone, et cetera. Sure. Yeah, got it, great, great stuff. So what metaphor best describes successful insurer innovation leadership styles? I think um, be a buffalo. Okay. So, what does uh, that mean? Yeah, <laughs> great question. So a buffalo, when a storm approaches, is mm -hmm. the only herd animal that will actually run directly into the storm. Um, so because of that counterintuitive act, they mm -hmm. spend less total time in the storm than mm -hmm. those animals that actually run away. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be innovative and achieve innovation, be a buffalo charge at the problem, charge at the issue, charge at the innovation, be an entrepreneur. I've never heard it framed that way. I really like mm. that. That's great. Be a buffalo, everybody. Okay, not just for insurer innovation, but all innovation in general. Um, okay, so we're going to change gears yeah. a little bit. Um, what's your superpower? 
Multitasking. Okay. I have a seven-year-old precocious daughter. Okay. I have a house full of animals and uh -huh. I travel almost every week. Wow. So it's really important that I have these superhero powers to be able to quickly switch between tasks Love and it. activities. Nice. <laughs> And so speaking of that, I mean, you're traveling a lot, you have a family, you have animals. How do you sort of strive for work-life balance? Yes, yes. Work-life balance, the elusive work-life balance. Right. I think that some days um, the balance is going to switch. Mm -hmm. Some days it's going to be a little bit heavier on the work side. And you have to be very conscientious of that and look at redistributing the weight mm -hmm. to the personal life. So I do a few things like I actually schedule personal activities in my calendar. I do the same. You do? I do <laughs> Wonderful. The same. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah we do things like that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mentioned hackathons mm -hmm. and my new passion for hacking. Yeah. Um, I bring my daughter to them. Okay. So when I have events like that, work mm -hmm. events like that, or volunteer events, yeah. she's a part of them. Got we it. spend valuable time together, but she's also learning. Yeah. Learning about tech. That's great. Do you have any sort of da daily habits or rituals that you do that helps you stay focused and productive? I do. Uh, I run every single day. Okay. Yeah, it keeps me focused. It helps to really focus my mind. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I come up with my most creative presentation ideas and product ideas while I'm running. I've experienced the same thing, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. So, and for me, that's when I get in the flow state, which is also yeah. sort of the runner's high. Yeah. Right. That's one way to do it. And so um, that I can completely relate to that. Yeah. Uh, so my last question for you, what's the culture like at Guide Guidewire? The culture is very collegial, mm -hmm. really friendly. Um, we're hardworking, but when I'm working, I'm laughing throughout the entire day. It's very fun. Sounds amazing. It is. Sounds amazing. 13 years. Wow. It's, there's a reason we stay. Thank you so much for your time, Laura. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Rajiv. This is Center Stage. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.